Well, honored uh, to be with you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for a couple more seconds. It always sounds so much more spiritual when you have a keyboard playing behind you. Um, I do come from Cleveland. Uh, we also have a team that is vying for Super Bowl contention. Uh, you have the Bengals, we have the Browns. We'll see how that shakes out over the next couple of years. But either way, we are all from Ohio, so always honored to be part of uh, what I consider to be family. It's been a few years since I've been here, but honored, love your pastors, and uh, everything that Brian said, I just echo back to him. I'm a better husband, better father, better pastor because of you, so thank you for being a, a steady and strong voice, a consistent. Your consistency is so great. You're a great pastor because of your consistency. Um, you got great messages, great vision, all of that, but there's something about the steadiness and the strength that you provide that brings a level of safety that I think people are drawn to. So thank you for, for who you are in my life and for this church. Uh, we're gonna jump in and close out your series. So if you have your Bible, Philippians chapter two is where we'll be today. Philippians chapter two, the apostle Paul has written this letter. We call him an apostle because that's kind of a gift, a calling that God gives individuals. Paul has traveled around and starting these pockets, these communities, which will become local churches. Then he follows up and writes them letters of encouragement, clarity on doctrine or belief, sometimes correction. And that's where we get a lot of our New Testament from is these letters that Paul, inspired by the Spirit, would write to followers of Jesus like you and like me in different places and cities scattered ultimately across the world. And we pick up on a letter that he's written to a group in a place called Philippi. We find the beginning of this church in the book of Acts. We can read kind of how it began to form and come together. It's the most unlikely of people that God has brought in to begin to shape this church in Philippi. And Paul is writing a letter to them because they're trying to figure out how do we remain faithful to Jesus, committed to one another in a city and in a time and in a culture that ultimately wants to pull us apart wants to pull our faith from us, wants to cause division between us. They're even dealing with some internal tensions within their church community. And so this is the letter we're picking up on and reading Paul's words. In Philippians chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 1. It says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each other esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What I would uh, love to do is just to take the opportunity in the close of the series and the few moments that we have together this morning and talk to you uh, from this subject, relationship roadblocks relationship roadblocks if you're taking notes. And I wanna focus on two. It's not an exhaustive list. You could add a lot more to this, but two primary roadblocks that other people or we ourselves tend to put in the way of having meaningful relationship. But if we could, one more time, let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, you are our teacher, our leader, our guide. Would you teach us, lead us, and guide us into the truth of your scripture. Let us leave this place different than the way that we came in. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, it was in the mid-90s that Randy Newman and Lyle Lovett composed the soundtrack for the, the now infamous movie Toy Story. Uh, it was not only a song that kind of summed up uh, the movie overall, but it was a chorus that would stick in your head for days. And when I sing it in just a moment, you will now, in the middle of the Super Bowl tonight, be playing this song over and over and over again, which is, you've got a friend in me. You're welcome. The Beatles had a song... The Beatles had a, a song a few decades before that that carried the same theme. It talked about, I get by with a little help from my friends. They also said they got with a little help from their friends, which we don't talk about in church. If you're a millennial, you were a fan of R&B in the 90s, the infamous Brandy came out with the song known as Best Friend, in which she said, friends may come and friends may go, but you should know that I got your back. It's automatic. And then... Uh, <laughs> For those uh, Christian millennials and boomers even, in the late 80s, 90s, Michael W. Smith popularized the Christian anthem for friendship when he sang, friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them. Friendship, relationship, 
is a deep ache that is implanted, I would argue, inside all of us by our creator to need one another. And we'll talk about it in just a moment. We don't live in a world that is conducive or trying to convince us that we need one another. We live in a time that is convincing us we're okay on our own. Uh, it was a teacher that I heard say, um, I don't know what it is that they have, but they have something special. I heard her telling another teacher as I was getting ready to leave the classroom, and she was talking about my group of friends in high school. Uh, we were a bunch of skateboarders and stoners. That was what made up my friend group. And we did anything but listen and respect our authority and our teachers and would get on their nerves. So when she said they have something special in that group, it kind of piqued my interest. And what she was saying was there was another student that had come to our school and was having a hard time connecting and making friends. This student was in a wheelchair and for whatever reason, just couldn't connect relationally with other people. But it was the skateboarders and the stoners that gladly accepted this one into their fold. And she noticed it so much so that she echoed it to another teacher that regardless of how I feel about these students, one thing they do have is something special in the way they're forming community. Do you know that one of the greatest witnesses that you and I have to let the world know that God exists and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is not our incredible evangelizing skills, not our apologetic approach to explain how God shows up in pain and suffering, not even our creative invites to church and how we can write great music or have great aesthetic, not how we can stand on the street corner with maybe compelling or non-compelling signs trying to convince people to give their life to God. But one of the greatest witnessing tools you and I have is how we live in community together as a sign to the world that God is good. Jesus actually prays in John chapter 14, a prayer that you and I get to be the answer to. He's praying publicly, I think, for our benefit. He's saying it to God, hey, I love you. Thank you that we're together. My prayer, though, is for them and them that come after these, the disciples and those that will eventually put their faith in me, that they would be one, just like you and I, God, are one. And by that, the world will know that you are good. So it's not, and thank God for all that stuff, the invites and the creativity and the music and witnessing and using our words. It's not that those aren't important, but we oftentimes discard the opportunity that we have to witness to those by thinking, well, I got to have one of these things and not considering that it's how I actually live in a relationship with other people that could be assigned to a world that is in disarray and ultimately, and you've talked about in the series, deeply lonely that people want something that pushes past the surface level, past the screen, to a place where they can be found, they can be heard, that they can feel, they can find enjoyment and fulfillment and meaning. And I think that's a glimmer of Jesus' prayer, that if they could be one like you and I are one, the world will see, I don't have good relationships. They're surface level at best, and they're filled with disappointment. And I'm not saying that the church's relationships are perfect and great. We'll talk about that today in a moment. But that we have an opportunity to live life together in a way that those outside of the faith look in and say, I don't know if I believe everything you guys believe, but I want what you have when it comes to that. It seems like you're for one another. It seems like you enjoy hanging out with one another. It seems like you figured out a way to disagree on topics that you might not find agreement on, but still love one another. There's a unity versus a schism. And it's an opportunity that we have and that you've beautifully been going down this journey on the past several weeks of saying it can be a great witness to our city, the way that we commit to one another. During the rule of the Roman Empire, amidst kind of all of the periodic catastrophes that it would suffer through its long history, none were ultimately as bad as two plagues that swept and ended up taking out a quarter of the population in each plague. Gerald Sitzer, who's a theology professor, kind of recounts this and writes about it in his book, Water from a Deep Well. It's the historical account that during the plagues, the role that Christians played, and he says this, Ironically, Christians survived the plague at higher rates than pagans, pagans just being unbelievers, even though Christians were more willing to be exposed to the deadly contagion. Why? Well, first, they cared for the sick. Such care ensured that a higher percentage of the afflicted would survive, even if there was no actual cure available. 
basic nursing care, sips of broth, cold rags on the forehead, tender back rubs, a change of bedding, visits from loving friends strengthened the sick and helped at least some of them to overcome the disease. Second, Christians who survived became immune and thus provided a workforce of healthy people who were no longer susceptible to the disease. These survivors made themselves available to the sick, which in turn increased survival rates even more. And finally, Christians believed in, prayed for, and experienced miracles. Miraculous cures and demon exorcisms occurred with enough frequency to leave an impression on pagans who interpreted these manifestations of power as evidence that the Christian God was real, thus making physically and dramatically visible the superiority of the Christian's patron power over all things. We have in our lineage, in our faith kind of family tree, a commitment that goes all the way back to one another committing to one another, even in the most unideal times. Plague is going on, you're sick. If I show up at your house, I could be exposed. No, thank you, I'm out of here. That wasn't the perspective of Christians. They said, I'll be in the most inconvenient places. I'll be there at the most unideal times. I will be there even if it might cost me something. That's deep commitment to relationship and community. And guess what happened? God showed up in the midst of them. God was like, I'm going to honor your commitment to one another to serve and to love one another and watch what I do. Began to perform miracles, created a synergy amongst the community that then echoed as a witness to the exterior world, those Christians have something. Here's the sad thing. Some of us won't even come to church anymore because the person that we used to sit next to in worship didn't like enough of our posts. They're committed to plagues and people dying, and you didn't like my Instagram picture enough, right? We see how backwards and how off that is, and I'm being a little hyperbolic in this moment, but, but you get it. We, and I, look, I'm putting myself out there, we are fickle, fragile people. We, if we have any sense of uh, kind of discomfort or wounding or disagreement with another person, and we'll talk about it in a moment, we are not quick to lean in harder to say, let's commit to one another, let's fight together, let's resolve this. We're like, I'll find somebody else I can get along with a little bit easier. I'm out. God, I pray that they would be one just like you and I are one. And we have the opportunity to be the answer to Jesus' prayer. But we put roadblocks in our way. And I would venture to say this. If we could this morning, as we are on this journey the past several weeks and leading into the opportunity that you will all have to join a life group, is this idea of biblical community um, is a beautiful thing, but it's not an easy thing. It's a beautiful thing, It's not going to be a perfect thing. And so let's go into this season of the church with eyes wide open, being honest, knowing other people aren't always the easiest to get along with. And let's be honest, I know you guys aren't. It was the 9 a.m. that really needed to hear it. But some of us are also not easy to get along with. Sometimes we cause the roadblocks. Other times people can kind of put up hindrances to meaningful relationships. And then there's times that we are our best sabotagers, that we put up these roadblocks as well. I don't know about you. I'm an expert, though, at telling people how they should live their lives. If people would come to me, I am full of all wisdom. Here's your problem. This is what you need to do. And now I roll that over into marriage. I've been married for 19 years this year. And I love my wife. She's amazing. But I will be honest, and I can do that since she's not here this morning. There's been times I've thought, gosh, our marriage would be so much better if she would just simply see things the right way. (laughs) The right way being my way. And I'm quickly kind of sobered and humbled when I realize, oh, actually, your way was a lot better than But there's this desire that all of us have oftentimes is to impose our preference, our ideas, our strategies, our methods on other people. If you would just do this, then we could get along. I would offer that you need people, and you've talked about this in this series, you need people that kind of rub you the wrong way. Why? 
Doesn't that kind of go against the idea of unity and synergy and commitment to one another? Why would I want somebody that kind of just rubs me the wrong way? I would say because you have some things on your life, in your personality, that need to kind of be scraped off. You need some people that confront you with a different viewpoint or a different personality or a different demeanor or a different temperament either. And you're like, I don't like being around them. And why? It's because it's taking the rough parts of your life or your personality and it's confronting you with them. And so discomfort can create some of the greatest strength and commitment to one another if we'll stick in it, if we'll stick through it, if we will ultimately commit to each other. And that is the store, that's the sore spot of relationships is when they just don't seem to stick. We've all probably faced disappointment when somebody's turned their back on us or they've walked out because that issue happened and we couldn't see it all the way through. And so there are a few things that hurt us as deeply as failed relationships, failed friendships, people we thought we were gonna do this together for, for life and now they're no longer here. And then, can we just be really honest, you add church in the mix of it and this takes on a whole new layer of complexity I find friendship and I find community here and then I'm serving and then I'm giving and, and then all of a sudden my faith is all intertwined in it and when something goes crossway with a relationship in the church, it kind of it makes a lot of dominoes begin to fall, it feels. And so the easy thing for a lot of us is I'll find another church or I'll, I'll unplug for a season. And so all of a sudden I find myself, which was once totally committed and inundated with a faith community. I thought I found my people, I've been hurt, and now I'm living in a level of isolation. I've withdrawn myself. And I would, we'll talk about it in a moment, say that's one of the most dangerous places to be. And I I think that is ideally where the enemy would love to get you to, to get you all alone. So let's talk about some relationship roadblocks. Here's two of them that we'll talk about. First one being autonomy. One of the roadblocks to meaningful relationship is that we have to come up against autonomy or, or really it's extreme autonomy. And how we define autonomy is just to be self-governed. I want to be in charge of my own life. I wanna make my, all my own decisions. I wanna structure my life in the way that I want it, that I find it most beneficial for me, most comfortable for me, most serving to me, and I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. Now listen, autonomy is a, a double-sided sword, double-edged sword. Because there is benefit to autonomy. There can be hard work. There can be self-discipline. There can be ownership that says, okay, it's on me. I'm going to make this thing happen. I'm going to do my due diligence. I'm going to rise up. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm going to take on that aspect of saying, okay, my personal responsibility for my life. There's beauty in that. But then there's a downside of it where autonomy can all of a sudden make us want to live on an island that I get to kind of be the, the king of my own life or the queen of my own life. And I will or won't allow certain people into my life based on if they serve my preferences or not. I want to be able to to determine, and, and there's a place for that, right? Like people that are abusive or very toxic, we need to make kind of those boundaries. But if we go too far with autonomy, we begin to create a world that only fulfills our deepest needs and longings and cares nothing for those that we're called to live alongside. Jesus did not pray in John 14, may they be in one with the person that they have everything in common with. There's no caveats to that. He's just like, let them be in one. All of their mess, all of their junk, all of their drama, the three Chiefs fans that were in here are a bunch of 49ers fans, apparently. I didn't realize how much Cincinnati dislike Taylor Swift. I feel like there's an undertone Taylor Swift in that grumbling right there. Sebastian Younger, uh, an author, writes this. He said, radical individualism were seeds of poison that were planted in the West. Again, this is the double side of the double-edged sword, that there's benefit even within our nation about freedom and independence and liberty and that self-governance that can be a beautiful thing. The problem is that goes so far, it can take deep root where it becomes poisonous. I don't want to depend on anybody else. I'm not going to depend on anybody else. I'm not even gonna open my life to anybody else. It's just me and me alone. Uh, A lot of us are content thinking, I can do life on my own. And for some of us, we may have been doing that for a while. Maybe you've got a couple years under your belt and you're like, listen, dude, 
I'm good. I don't need anybody. I would just say, who's defining what good is in your life? How do you define that that life that you're living is actually good? How do you know you're not missing out on something that could make it even better? Is there risk? Is there exposure to get involved with relationship and community? Of course. But the payoff on the other side could be way better than you could even imagine that you're missing out on right now. I I can remember uh, several months ago, we've been in this long renovation process in our offices, very similar to your guys' HQ. And I was in a a room one day hanging, um, it's kind of like a glass blackboard. It's like a marker board, kind of like a dry erase, but it's glass, so it's pretty heavy. And we had hung one up on the third floor that was significantly bigger, needed multiple people to do it. And I'm there that day getting ready to hang a smaller one, but still need multiple people. But I am in this moment revealing my personality, which is, I could do this on my own. And so I've got it all kind of taken out of the box and I'm prepping the wall and, you know, it comes from overseas and there's the instructions in it. I take the instructions out and it says, hey, pin this against the wall and then just drill the holes that you see on the instructions and that'll line up so you can put the board up there. So I go ahead, I drill the holes and then I get the board ready. And if you could have tapped into the camera that was in that office that I was getting ready to hang things on, you would have seen a spectacle. Because here I am and I'm picking up this blackboard and I'm balancing it on one knee I'm reaching back for the drill. I'm putting my 40-year-old back in a very compromising position. I'm kind of navigating through this. I'm drilling all of the holes, trying to get it all lined up. I get one corner in. I reach, and I, I finally get the other corner in, and then I step back, and the whole thing is just wonky. I was like, what happened? I look at the instructions, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Everything's a half inch off. Thanks a lot, China. Like, I can't line these holes up. So I go upstairs to where the rest of the staff was. I said, hey, um, I, I, uh, I need some help. And they're like, all right. And so they come downstairs to where I'm at, and they see this crooked hanging blackboard, and they see all of the extra holes that have now been drilled in the wall. And they said, uh, you know, you could have asked us to come downstairs, and we would have helped you, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I thought I could just do it on my own. And to be honest, there was probably some place deep in my heart where I wanted to be able to hang it and then have them come after the fact and think, I'm so impressed that you did that on your own. And that's how a lot of us live our life, is we want to be good at curating our world so that people will look at it and think, what a great job you've done. The problem with that is, is that in the Bible, God is always set on forming a people and he doesn't look at them and say, look at what you've done. His desire is for us to look at one another and say, look what we've done. Look what God is doing amongst our midst. Look how God is developing. Look how God is stretching. Look how God is changing our lives. Extreme autonomy ultimately can lead to isolation. And isolation is a dance partner with sin. That one of the the, the ploys of the enemy is to get you and me to be by ourselves. And when we're by ourselves, we're navigating this process of like my own flaws, my own failures, my own sin. And I don't have anybody externally to be able to speak into my life and acknowledge or help me acknowledge my faults and my failures. I don't have any friends that say, hey, I just, I was over last night. We were eating dinner. You're pretty short-tempered with your kids, man. Like, you okay? Do you need prayer for anything? Or I don't have anybody that I live life with and I'm open to and I'm sharing about issues in my heart or where my relationship in my marriage might be and them to be able to say, hey, listen, I've seen how you've been treating your wife and I think you need to honor her and serve her better. You're being really prideful in this season. I'm gonna pray for you. If I don't open myself up to that, eventually sin has found a concealed environment like mold to grow in, and it can become toxic after a while. And the enemy is like, if I can get you isolated, I can get you only thinking about yourself and be blind to the things that he's actually working in our life to ultimately deform us. You've heard it said before, the first issue in the Bible wasn't sin, but solitude. God shows up and it wasn't that Adam was in sin he needed to fix, it was that Adam was alone. And God said, it is not good for him to be alone. There needs to be relationship. And we see, and you've talked about the effects of loneliness in our nation, ultimately in our world that are playing out in the culture and how lonely we end up uh, truly being. Uh, We also know the danger of this idea when it comes to, uh, we look at our prison system 
the worst thing you can experience in the prison system other than maybe the death penalty is solitary confinement. And prison officials call solitary confinement the prison within the prison. It's a central feature of that solitary confinement, the idea of social isolation. It results in increased anxiety studies, say, depression and mental illness. Isolation isn't uh, negative attention, it's no attention, which is often worse. And solitary confinement unravels, ultimately, our humanity. When you are by yourself and you have not opened up your heart, your life, your mind, your home, your emotions to anybody else, you are stuck with just you and you alone. And that is a very dangerous place to live your life. Uh, about a year ago, I um, got in bed one night and uh, my wife was reading a book and I, I had a, a notification pop up that uh, a show that I really liked, the second series came out. And I was like, oh, I really like the first series. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to begin to watch the second series. And so I get about 15 minutes into the first episode, and I'm like, I don't know. Something's not feeling right about this. There's some spiritual stuff that, you know, wasn't really in the first season. And I don't know, I just, like, felt one of those, like, ah, like, we, you know, growing up at Charismatic, we say, felt a check in my spirit. <laughs> I got an unction, you know? Like, I just, I felt, ugh, like something. I was like, oh, I'm not going to, I probably shouldn't be watching this. So I turn it off, and God, forgive me for watching that. I'm not, I'm not going to watch it. Like, I'll just skip out on the second season. Well, wouldn't you know it, 24 hours later, get back in bed that night, and I'm like, well, let me give it a shot one more time. Maybe it was just something I ate that night for dinner, made me feel some type of way. And I jump back in, and I finish the first episode, and I, I get about five, ten minutes into the second episode, and that same, ugh, I just, I don't know, I just don't feel right about it. Okay, okay, I'll, I'm going to turn it off. God, forgive me. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have watched that. You know, I'm, I'm gonna commit, I'm not gonna watch that. About two to three days later, got some time on my hands. Let, let me just check one more time. Sure enough, pull it up, get a few more moments into that episode again and that same level of conviction settles. I'm like, no, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This time for real, I'm done. And I turn it off and, God, forgive me for going back to it. I know I shouldn't have. Because I knew the danger was if I would have made it through that episode, that level of conviction would have gotten lighter and lighter. I would have, in the language of Scripture, calloused my heart to the leading of the Spirit. And I would have finished that whole second season. Who knows what I would have let into my heart and into my mind. The problem was, after that third time, I had an honest moment before God. I prayed. It was like, hey, I'm repenting. You know, I, I knew I shouldn't have, but I did anyways. I'm sorry. Um, but then, I, as I went on, I still felt like this, like, ugh, from that thing, from the, from, the, from the show. And I was in the shower one morning, probably about a week after I'd kind of had that last episode and prayed. And I knew God had forgiven me. I knew we were good. But I was like, why do I still have this, like, stain on my soul that I can't get rid of? And I was in the shower that morning praying. And I was like, God, I just feel like you know my heart. I'm not going to go back to watch it. I repented. I know it's not right. I'm good but why do I still have this thing? And I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart and said, I want you to text Darren and I want you to tell him about what you went through with this show. To which I, in the shower, was like, mm, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not gonna text my friend being like, hey, I watched this show and I felt like I shouldn't. And like, what I wanted to say, I was like, God, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. What else you got? What's option B, right? That's <laughs> what we do with God. And, uh, and he just wouldn't let me get rid of it. He's like, no, you gotta, you, I want you to tell him what happened. And I'm like, this is so silly. But all right, I'll do it. And so uh, he lives in California. So that morning I got out and I didn't want to call him because it had been like 5 a.m. his time. So I just sent him a long text. I was like, he'll respond. And I, just, I laid it all out. I said, hey, here's the situation. Explained everything. Sent him a text, and a couple hours later, when the sun finally hit California and he woke up, he just responds back, and he says, hey, thanks for your openness. Uh, you're forgiven. Go in peace. And I can't tell you all of the details. I, I can't explain it all. All I know is that when he responded and I read that text, that uh, just lifted off my heart. And now I, he, theologically, let me just make this statement. I don't believe Darren forgave me of my sins. God did that when I prayed the week before. 
But what I think I experience was what Jesus' half-brother James writes in the end of his letter where he says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. And I would just propose this, that for some of us, the healing or the freedom or the breakthrough or the provision or the wisdom or the answer that we need, that we've been praying to God for but have not yet received, might be on the other end of a commitment to biblical community. That God is saying, I need you to enter into this first before you get to experience that that I want you integrated into a spiritual community. I want you integrated into a life of of a church, a local church where your, your roots are growing down deep, where you can live in covenantal commitment to one another. And that person might have the very thing that I've equipped them with, a grace for your life that I have not given you because it's found in relationship. That on the other end of your obedience or my obedience is the thing that we so desperately want from God. And some of us are missing out on the healing that God offers us because we are not in a community of healers. We're just not committed in a relationship of people that we can confess our faults and our failures to, our sins to, our worries, our fears, our anxieties that can listen and say, I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to take that burden on with you hey, I just want to affirm some things in your life. Yeah, go in peace. God is with you. God loves you. That they have the words that God's placed in them of life for us to experience what God has for us. That we might not be able to experience outside of it. Because if we live in isolation, if we embrace the roadblock of autonomy, we will begin not only to lose our identity and who God's called us to be amongst his people, ultimately we can begin to lose our mind. We can begin to see things and think things and process things that are simply not true. Again, nobody in the 11, only in the 9 o'clock has done this, where you have taken a scenario and painted a picture about somebody else in your mind that you have no real basis for believing. But because you haven't been able to process it with that person, because you're not in a community that challenges uh, kind of the the paintbrush or the colors that you're using to paint that individual, you and I are then left to whatever our imagination comes up with must be reality. And that's a dangerous place to be in. We can see this in the film with Tom Hanks, Castaway. Remember, he's by himself and he begins to lose his mind. So what does he do? He comes up with a friend, which is a volleyball, Wilson, Wilson. It's what he calls him. So he's talking to Wilson, and that one he loses Wilson at one point. He's like, Wilson! You know, and we look at that, and we're like, man, that's so crazy. Who would talk to a volleyball as a friend? And I would say probably the same people that pull away from other human interactions and think they can talk to a glass screen and find meaningful relationship in that. We do the same thing. Well, this is the safest place to be. I have friends on this. Thing. Come on. They don't know you. They got to be in person with you. They got to smell your coffee breath to really know you. They got to see the mannerisms. They got to see the tics. They got to see how you approach things, how you pro. They got to feel your presence. You have to feel theirs. And that that is, I think, the, the call to family that God has desired to create. Drew Hunter in his book, Made for Friendship, says this. To shift the posture of your life away from others, whether through purposeful withdrawal or passive isolation, is to turn away from your very design. This is why friendlessness is dehumanizing. Without relationships of love, we eventually become more like animals. In his classic book on friendship, Alred of Rivreau wrote, those who claim that their lives should be such as to console no one and to be a burden um, or the occasion of grief to no one who derive no joy from others' successes and inflict no bitterness on others with their own sin, I would call not human beings, but beasts. They have only one goal, neither to love nor to be loved by anyone. Paul Simon compared deliberate isolation to being like a rock In his song, I Am a Rock, he wrote, I have no need for friendship. Friendship causes pain. But then a rock isn't quite human. Rocks don't feel pain, true, but they also don't know pleasure. C.S. Lewis picked up on it and said, love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you wanna make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it up carefully, round with hobbies, little luxuries, avoid all entanglements, lock it up safe, 
in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken, but it will be unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. Second roadblock is disillusionment. If we live in autonomy, we become deformed, not the person that God's called us to be. The second thing is disillusionment. I have a friend, Jordan, who uh, you would know has this thing called disillusionment cycle that he came up with. And I was like, I love that. I'm going to steal it. Probably not give you credit, but I just did. So if he complains, the disillusionment cycle goes like this. We get excited about something, but eventually get disillusioned by that. And because disillusionment sets in, we search for something else that excites us. And so I just got a new relationship, a new friend or a dating relationship. I'm really excited, but I wait around long enough and they chew their salad really loud. And so back to Tinder, this isn't gonna work out. I'm disillusioned and we start the cycle all over again. And we do this all the time with relationships. We do this with our jobs. I talk to people all the time that are so pumped. They're excited, like, I just found the job of my dreams. I love it. I start next week. I'm like, man, that's amazing. What an answer to prayer. And then you follow up three months later, you're like, how's it going? And they're like, horrible. I hate it. I'm quiet quitting, actually. Looking on LinkedIn, I'm looking for another job. I'm like, it's only been three months. They're like, I know, they want me to like do my work and show up on time. So lame. I'm like, you were so excited. Now you're so disillusioned. Listen, life groups are so exciting. But look, hear me clearly. There will be a moment you will find disillusionment. Somebody's going to disappoint you in the group that you're committing to. They're gonna say something or not be thoughtful or something's gonna frustrate you, whatever it might be. And there's gonna be a temptation to give into disillusionment and then cause you to pull back in autonomy. Like, oh, I guess I gotta find something else that excites me. No, 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 let's break the cycle. So when excitement happens and we get into disillusionment, the best thing you can do is not look for more excitement, but it's to embrace adjustment. Okay, okay, I didn't like how that went down. What's the best scenario right now for us to have a conversation? How can I share my feelings? What in the language of Paul to Philippians can I do to elevate and value others above myself? How can I embrace humility? How can I go low before we go high? And as I adjust and I live in that place of tension that doesn't feel comfortable or feel good, might be frustrating, might cost me some time and some honest conversation. Once I work through that process of adjustment though, then I move up into things that are fulfilling, that are enjoyable. And I'm on the other side of my disillusionment. And I'm like, gosh, I'm so glad that I stuck around. It was rough for a little bit there. I wasn't sure how that was gonna shake out, but I committed, I didn't dip out. I didn't cut ties. I didn't leave and look for the easy way out. I stuck it out and I, I adjusted. I learned some things about myself. I learned some things about you. I learned some things about us as a community. And now I find real enjoyment that I wouldn't have otherwise had. The ache, and it is an ache for deep relationship, is oftentimes not a result of sin, but I think rather it's, it's a godly ache that he's placed inside of us because God is a triune God. He lives in relationship. And that desire that he has, he's transferred into our hearts. The great Dr. Tim Keller said, Adam was not lonely because he was imperfect, but because he was perfect. The ache for friends is the one ache that is not the result of sin. This one ache that is part of his perfection, God made us in such a way that we cannot enjoy paradise without friends. God made us in such a way that the Edenic ache that we cannot enjoy our joy without human friends. Adam had a perfect quiet time every day, 24 hours. He never had a dry one, and yet he needed relationship. He needed friends. And one of the challenges is that we can't stand firm like Paul prays in Philippians in one spirit if we don't stick around long enough. I can't stand firm and experience unity and blessing and beauty if I don't stick around long enough in the community that God's called me to. And it's the detriment of options. We just think we have too many options. The thing about the Philippians, when Paul writes this letter, is they're kind of stuck together. 
There's no other church for them to go to. They're not like, I'm going down to First Baptist to Philippi because I didn't like Queen City anymore. It's like, I guess we're kind of stuck with one another. And so Paul's encouraging them to figure it out, to work through it. The question I would say as we get ready to close, as you are inevitably processing maybe some really difficult relationships in your life right now, and I would say as you jump into future relationships and challenges come forth, when you begin to have that perspective or that heart posture towards that individual, ask who is more pleased with the state of those relationships in your life, God or Satan? Who likes your position, your posture towards them? Have, have I allowed offense and bitterness and resentment and anger to creep in that if I were to take this and hold this before God, me and this per person or me and these people, who's smiling at the state of that relationship more? Is God like great bitterness, great resentment? You do you, girl. That's right. I can't believe they said that to you. You have every right to be mad and bitter. Or is it the enemy that's saying, yeah, division. Yeah, stay away from them. Yeah, don't share your feelings. Yeah, don't extend forgiveness. It was uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who wrote the book, Life Together. He was a German pastor, theologian, a thinker at the time of the Nazi regime rising to power. And there was a great concern with his peers that were stateside that thought, hey, we need to get Dietrich out of Germany because uh, the threat to his life is gonna become too great. We need to preserve him, his writing, his thinking, that the world needs his voice. The Christian world needs his voice. Let's get him to safety. And, and he does leave for a minute, gets out of the country, but then he realizes, no, 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 I, my place is to be back there. I have to be back there. And he goes back and he begins a, a seminary to train uh, people in the ministry. It's in a place called Finkenwald. And word gets out over time about the intensity of community and training that these students are doing under the kind of tutelage of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And so some pastors say, let's fly to Germany, let's see it with our own eyes, and let's convince Dietrich you're going a little bit too hard. Like what you're requiring of all these students is a little bit too much. So they get there and they're there on the grounds of Finkenwald and they're talking to Dietrich about it. And they're like, this is, you're asking these people to commit too much to one another. And Dietrich says, come with me. And they get in a boat and they go up river. And as they go up river, they get to a hill, and they get out of the boat and they walk up on top of the hill. And Dietrich calls the pastors that traveled across the, the world to be with him and says, come up here, do you see that? And he points and the other pastors begin to kind of focus in on what their eyes are, are taking in, which is it's a Nazi training camp. They see all the trucks and they see the marching in unison and they see the training and they see all of the work and the hustle and the bustle that is going on. And Dietrich says this, and he points back at Finkenwald, this has to be stronger than that. What we're doing here with one another, this community, what we're learning, how we're growing together, this has to be stronger than that. And I would say his words still echo all these decades later. This has to be stronger than what's out there. In a world of depression and anxiety and loneliness, in a world of brokenness and despair and darkness, what's out there, this, the community of believers living life together in, I love that term, biblical community, commitment to one another, even when it's not easy, this has to be stronger than that because it's what God has for you. It's the fulfillment of every dream and purpose that he's placed in your life. And it serves as a witness to the world that there's a better way to live.